So I'm going to kick this off today uh, with a conversation you'll see in your program. This one is about a, a business case for civic engagement. And I'm going to call three gentlemen to the stage. I'll ask them to come up. Josh Koppelman, Michael Rubin, and David Edelman. These are three guys I've known for some time. I think all of you probably know them. Put up your hand if you've heard of any, any of these three guys. All right. This is, I knew this was a good way to start this off. Come on up. Michael, uh, next to me, has uh, you'll know him for a lot of things. He's been in the news a lot in the last uh, year or so, but he's the CEO of Kinetic. He's the co-founder of the Reform Alliance. Kinetic has, uh, uh, is a holding company for a number of, the, uh, number of companies that you'll know about, including uh, the uh, Fanatics. Uh, Josh is a seed stage investor. He's the founder of First Round Capital. I think he was like 12 years old when he founded Half.com which I think he sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and he is in the business of finding early stage investments. Uh, and he has had some remarkable successes that he's knocked out of the park. And, and I've had the good fortune to have known him for many years. He's sort of, uh, as a business reporter, he steered me in some good directions and introduced me to some remarkable people. Uh, and David Edelman uh, is an entrepreneur as well. He's the CEO of Campus Apartments. It's a great story, if you don't know it, about how he got started uh, in that game. But more importantly, David has, uh, in recent years, as have all of these guys, they have devoted themselves, having made a lot of money and become very influential, to matters that are not necessarily about making more money, but about sharing their resources and their know-how and their expertise and their contacts uh, in a way that makes this city uh, better. They, they have decided that it is their time in life, and normally with uh, rich guys like you, we have to wait till you're substantially older to see this happen, right? It, it has become good, it's a good thing in society, that whether it's societal pressure or just good stuff, that when, when really wealthy people uh, get much older, they make some decisions about how to distribute their money. These three gentlemen, uh, in the prime of their working lives, have decided that they are going to start to do things. I, I just want to say, better. David and Josh are definitely older now. Yeah. Just, yeah. To, just to clarify. Yes. Yeah. Michael is still not I'm yet so in the you, prime of his life. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start with you as a result of that. Uh, the, the point here is conversations about civic engagement. There's a dot, dot, dot here, uh, which we didn't put, and that is your civic engagement looks different than other people's civic engagement because you come with a lot of resources and a lot of business smarts. So you can move the needle on some things uh, faster than or more effectively than some people can, and you have done that in the last couple of years. Whether with your friend Meek Mill or with other matters, you've sort of made a decision that I can get things done, I can get in there, I can cut through some red tape, I can, I can make noise to get things done. Tell me about how you think of civic engagement to, to, make, to, to improve things around you and what needs to continue to be improved. And I will say, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael is uniquely involved in criminal justice reform because that's an issue close to his heart. Well, I think the first thing you need to, you need to realize is it's, it, you've got to do something that you really care deeply about. For me, until two years ago, um, I was always someone who was happy to, to give back, but I did it basically by writing checks. Um, there was nothing I really personally cared about. And then something really resonated with me. I saw a friend of mine go through a terrible situation, and I felt like I had to take action first to help him. And then when I realized the problem was so much bigger than him, we had to turn it into something much bigger. So for me, I think it's really about being authentic, something you really care about. Um, the one thing I will say is, is I think when you take a business approach to a um, to um, you know, a problem like criminal justice reform, I think that can get a much better outcome. You know, I was just last week talking about actually on a, and I was on CNBC talking about how I think it's actually good to put pressure on people that have been financially successful to really give back, and 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 I think you can get much better returns if you take a entrepreneurial approach toward a problem that maybe hasn't had that kind of entrepreneurialism historically. So, and, and you look at the criminal justice system, particularly, by the way, as it applies to Philadelphia, where we've got a high poverty rate, and we have a lot of people incarcerated for things that, from an economic perspective, don't make sense. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you, for, for me, I grew up in a very, you know, middle class, you know, plus, you know, family. I didn't believe that people went to prison for not committing crimes. And, and I think, I talk to people like, a lot of people in this room every day, and I say, do you understand that people go to, to prison and jail every day for not committing crimes? And most people actually don't understand that. And 25% of the people go to prison each 
year go for what's called a technical probation violation. That means they didn't commit a crime. They, in 80% of the situation, they either tested positive for smoking marijuana, they um, paid their, um, they, they couldn't afford to pay their fines, or they missed a, proba- a meeting with probation right. a lot of times because they have jobs, they don't want to lose their job. And we're sending 180,000 people a year to prison um, for technical probation violations. I didn't believe that was possible. So when I saw that, and I, I went through what, what, what Meek and I went through together for me kind of living through his situation with him, um, we, you know, I think we had to go out and try to change the laws. And we're f- starting first in Pennsylvania. This is really, it's a state-by-state state issue. 90% of the people in prison and jail are in, um, or it's, it's actually a state issue, not a federal issue. And I think we've got to work really hard to, to, to change the laws to make sure they're rational while keeping communities safe. So it's something I care deeply about. And I think, uh, you know, we're just getting started. We've been at it for about a year, and I think we've got a big uh, opportunity ahead of us. And there's going to be a lot of discussion today about those types of things, the intersection between poverty and criminal justice and this, this fact that, that many people don't know. Some of us have learned this over the years, that there are all sorts of people. I, I remember during the uh, Ferguson, Missouri uh, troubles, I remember parents telling me their biggest nightmare is their kids getting a driver's license because they're out driving and a light is out on the car, they get a citation for it, the fine is too much for them to pay, they don't pay the fine, and then that person enters the criminal justice system, is likely to get pulled over, arrested, put into jail. No crime committed, but but that's what happens. Hey, something people still probably don't fully understand, Meek Mill went to prison three different times for never committing a crime. One time he used a water pistol in a music video and he went to prison for 90 days. Yeah. Like, and he would tell me these stories. I didn't believe they were possible until you saw it firsthand. So the, and Pennsylvania, by the way, is one of the worst states in the country. It's actually the third worst state of, of our 50 states for the percentage of people on probation. One in 35 people in Pennsylvania are on probation or parole, which is crazy. Georgia is actually the worst state, one in 17 people. Um, you just think about um, m- most states have caps on how long you can be on probation. Pennsylvania doesn't have limits today, so there's so much to do to change the laws to get this to be logical where it's um, fair and equitable for everybody. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you are actually moving the needle on this topic. But David, I want to go to you because one of the great things about looking at this panel, th- there is something fun about the fact that in this city there are uh, people like you who are – you guys are young. You guys have a lot of your life ahead of you. The beauty of you making money as you did uh, early in your life is that you've been able to think about these things early enough. At some point, you've des- you decided um, you've been a good beneficiary of, of the place you're in, of business ideas, of the right support, um, and, and you decided that some of this now has to, has to move into giving back. Tell us a bit of your story. I, I think there might be three or four people who haven't heard your story because it's so well told, um, and you and I have discussed it on, on TV, the idea that you, start, you learned your money lessons very, very early, uh, in, in, starting in a basketball game. So uh, Michael's laughing because he knows I'm not... He couldn't possibly play right? basketball. There's no um, chance. You could the idea that he would lose a bet playing basketball seems very obvious to Michael. So, yeah. So, you know, the story is really simple. Uh, everyone growing up has a family friend that you call your uncle who's not really your uncle. Um, I have had and have one of those who, at 11 years old, I'm playing basketball with him. And I said, I, I'll, I bet I can beat you. And he's, you know, to this day, most people let a little kid win. Uh, my partner, Alan, did not. And, uh, <laughs> For those who know, he's the guy at the Sixers game with the white hair, the sixth man who sits four seats away from me. He's still a competitive guy at 76 years old. But uh, I basically lost my basketball, my football, uh, my baseball glove, and back then, uh, you know, my bank book. And I had to go to Campus Apartments, his company, every Saturday and stack lumber as an 11-year-old to earn each possession back. My parents thought that would, you know, I, I am proud to say I no longer have a gambling problem. <laughs> but... Um, Two years later, I had a little bit of money from my bar mitzvah, gave it to him to invest in my first building, and that's how I kind of got baptized into the real estate business. And so, uh, you know, for me, that was kind of my addiction. I, you know, I, I went there, I worked summers, weekends, vacations. I just thought, you know, the ability to invest in old real estate, renovate it, and create it was an exciting proposition for me. And, and, and tell me what the transition has been for you. When, when in your career did civic engagement become important? 
So it was interesting. Growing up, you know, I, I can't say that my parents were overly charitable or, you know, gave me these great values about giving. They were, gen you know, supported causes, but I can't say they had, like, you know, the cause or anything like that. Uh, I think it happened, you know, when I entered the business community kind of in my mid-20s, and there's some great Philadelphians, you know, older than us, you know, some who have passed away, but, you know, the Ron Rubens, the Steve Cozens, the Lenfests, you know, who passed, and they, they were just great civic leaders, and what they all had in common is they were competitive business people, but they also took a moment to give back and support a cause, whatever that cause was. And so I spent my mid to late 20s just saying, like, I want to do something like that. And so, like, kind of to what Michael did, I would write checks of different sizes to someone else who had a good idea, but I couldn't say that I was super passionate about something on my own, but I was like, hey, I should give something, I should do something. You know, and then that changes over time as you find something that you're interested in. Uh, Josh, one of the things that you do is that your, the course of your work uh, is sort of civic engagement for a long time because you have been seeding ventures uh, often that are born out of uh, the great universities in the Philadelphia area. You've decided that, look, these companies will be successful. Some of them will be successful and they won't have anything to do with Philadelphia, but people like that origin story, right? They tend to connect to it, so that might bring value into this place. So you've been involved for some time in the discussion of how Philadelphia becomes more of a place uh, for particularly tech ventures, but small ventures, risk capital. Uh, this, is, this is not something that was always in place. There's always been a, a, a bit of it. You are one of those guys. You graduated. You invented something uh, largely while you were at college and succeeded. And, and you've decided that's somewhere you want to put your energies. Yeah, you know, it, there, it's been really fun to watch the city grow um, over the last 30 years. So I didn't grow up in Philadelphia. I've lived um, in Pennsylvania for 30 years since I came to Penn and I never left. Um, so I'm now a Philadelphia and I, all, all, all sports teams have now transitioned over to Philadelphia sports teams. But when I graduated college, I started my first company, I co-founded it um, after my sophomore year. And when I graduated, we had 20 employees, but I wasn't paying myself. It was, it was really, um, it, 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 it was hard to raise our first round of capital. And Penn sends out this uh, questionnaire when you graduate because they want to be able to sort of do a survey of how their class is doing in terms of getting jobs. And for the most part, they want to say like X percent are bankers and Y percent are consultants. And when I'm looking through the survey, I realized like the only box I could check was unemployed because that was the closest thing to where I was. And when you compare that um, in 93 to the, to the, to the si situation today where um, you know, the barrier to entry in terms of starting a company has come way down. The first company, my first company, we had to raise $5 million to get to first product shipped. Today, people are launching businesses on $50,000, so two orders of magnitude um, drop. And, and what that's really done is it's democratized entrepreneurship. It's made it so that um, um, it's far more accessible. Um, you know, in 2006, if you wanted to build a mobile app, you needed $2 million and you needed to negotiate a deal with AT&T and Verizon. Today, you need $99 to be an Apple authorized developer and you're in the app store and you can do it from a dorm room. So it's been fun to sort of see, um, while, while there's still advantages to Silicon Valley in New York, it, it, the, the playing field's gotten far more level and, and, and the Philadelphia startup ecosystem has really benefited from that. How does that translate into making this a better city? So I think the fundamental characteristic of an, of an entrepreneur is someone who could imagine something different, right? So sort of the most powerful entrepreneurial pitch is someone walks into a room and begins with, imagine if. And, and, and whether it's like, imagine if all of the books and music and, you know, and, and movies that are on your bookshelves could be monetized, and like that was my imagine if for half.com, right? So, my imagine if is how many people here ever read a book by, you know, Danielle, uh, Danielle Steele, Stephen King, John Grisham, everyone would raise their hand. If I asked you how many people have read it twice, no one would raise your hand. Well, imagine if you could just, you know, monetize that and compete with Amazon. Like, that was my imagine if, but, but it doesn't just have to be in one industry. And I think that creating a, a, a generation of people who are willing to imagine things different 
could translate to all aspects of life, whether it's, um, you know, and we're going to need it. Um, you know, I see on a daily basis, I see business plans where companies want to take automation and AI um, and, you know, we're going to use AI to replace labor to do X. We're going to replace cashiers. They've already replaced toll collectors. We're going to replace travel agents and stockbrokers. But it's, it's going to be, you know, radiologists and optometrists and drivers. And, 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 and it's really hard to imagine what a city is going to be like in 10, 20, 30 years when, with this level of disruption. And we're going to need both for-profit and non-profit, um, you know, entrepreneurs to imagine a better, a better city. So, David, this is interesting from your perspective because you're in the housing business. Uh, in a place like Philadelphia and in many cities, poverty, housing are major, major issues. Now, the one thing, uh, Josh talks a lot about AI and, um, you know, in, in how many states driving is, is, you know, the biggest profession. That'll be disrupted or, or a bunch of repetitive tasks. But the one thing that is going to stay is housing. We're going to need housing. We're going to need better ways of thinking about housing. And, and to some degree, you've been preparing for this all your career. You've, you've been thinking about better housing and the intersection with poverty. And that is something this, this city has to solve. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the first part of what you said is kind of my investor pitch, right? You can't, you know, people always need a place to live, right? The kind of a state can't actually product. outsource that. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, you know, it's hard to disrupt, you know, a place to sleep. Um, I, I think, you know, for us, one of Philadelphia's biggest challenges is... Um, when you look at our cost of doing business in the city and you look at our cost of construction compared to New York, okay? So the cost of construction, New York is only about 20%, 30% tops more to build, but the rents they achieve are two to three X, okay? So like you have a fundamental economic problem here in Philadelphia. Um, and, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, but most of it has to do with this kind of intersection of, you know, government and how complicated they make things to build here. Um, I think you also have, and you talk about poverty, one of the things I've been preaching, even though you predominantly I house college students, we shouldn't be spending time preparing everyone for college. Some people just aren't built to go to college, and I think that's great, okay? And I think we don't have the right jobs. A... Apprentice electrician in the city of Philadelphia makes $80,000 a year with a high school degree. You can't find enough electricians in the city of Philadelphia. So our, our ability, I think it comes this intersection of creating you know, trade schools, better re legislation to make affordable and workforce housing happen. And I think you know, we'll probably talk about it. It's something Josh and I are spending a lot of time on. Um, this city council doesn't get it. And I think they're missing the boat on how you can be pro-business and pro, you know, anti-poverty, I guess is kind of the way I would phrase it. That is something we should be discussing today, how, how, to, how to walk that line. It's a, it's a national conversation that we're... Well, it's a national conversation, but you're sitting in yeah. the largest big city with the highest poverty rate in the nation, 24%. It's embarrassing, okay? We have the highest poverty of any big city in the country. It's not something we should be proud of. You know, and you're sitting in a $1.4 billion building here, and yet that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to talk about it, but I do want to ask Michael about uh, something I, I want to get to because you, you heard his passion about criminal justice reform. How do you, uh, with your resources and your reach, how do you move the needle on this? How do you get this conversation going? When it was with Meek Mill, you, I think, were involved in uh, publicity campaigns and things like that, but fundamentally, your influence is bigger than a bus that says free Me Meek Mill on it. Yeah, for me, for me, it's very straightforward. Again, I, you know, I'm being very blunt. I, I didn't understand this year or care about it until two years ago when something really bad happened to Meek. When you watch one of your close friends go to prison for not committing a crime. And to be, to be clear, Meek called you and told you, I think this is going to go bad. And you're thinking, Why, how could it go bad? You, you haven't well, done anything serious. He, he had told me for years about this crazy judge who kept sending him to prison for not committing a crime. And, like, you, I heard it, but it was almost so unbelievable, I didn't actually believe it. Right. And, I like, I believe him because he was my boy, but I just, it was like, it just, it didn't pass the sanity test. And um, I'd watched him go to prison one time before, 
And he said to me um, in November of 2017, he said, hey, you know, I've got this hearing for, you know, I popped a wheelie on a, on a motorcycle. Do you want to come to the hearing with me so you can see what really happens? And you're, and you're thinking to yourself, a guy doesn't go to jail for popping a wheelie on a motorcycle. No possibility. And so I actually wrote a letter to the judge and kind of, you know, gave her a little bit about, about my background and being from Pennsylvania and, you know, kind of a lot of jobs that we created and my involvement with the Sixers and thought that it would be helpful to him. I went to the hearing, um, you know, Meek, probation, I think everyone knows the story. Probation officer got up and said, he's done great. We recommend no sentence. DA got up and said, we recommend no sentence. And the judge sent him to prison for two to four years. And at that point, I really thought this was just a bad judge. Mm. And that's where I was so wrong. It's the system that was broken that allowed that judge to do something really bad. And so when she sent him to prison for two to four years, I looked at him, I looked at his mom, and I said, I'm not stopping until I get you out of prison. And fortunately, Jay-Z's partner was sitting next to me. I met her for the first time. She said the same thing. And so the first several months was all about how do we get him out of prison? We weren't thinking about anything but that. And then he said to me a hundred times in the previous three or four years, you know, he was charged with pointing a gun at multiple police officers. He said, Michael, if I pointed a gun at multiple police officers, that's called suicide. Right. Like, they would be doing their job to shoot you. Like, you can't point a gun at multiple police officers and be here. And so we had all these investigators focused on the judge and her background and a bunch of bad things we learned about her. He said, stop focusing on the judge. I didn't point the gun. And the first police officer that the investigators interviewed said um, he didn't point the gun. The whole thing's a lie. He said, will you sign an affidavit? They said, yes. And this was actually February of 2018. And I called Mika. I said, you're going to be out of prison in a couple of days. It took another three months to get him out of prison when what he did originally when he was 19, he never did. And so that was when the light bulb went off and said this whole system is fundamental. This is not a, this is a not hate the player, it's hate the game. There is actually a game problem here. The, the underlying system was so broken. And so once Mika got out of prison, we talked, the, our whole conversation shifted from how do we get you out of prison to once you get out of prison, how do we fix the underlying issue? And um, once he got out, I started kind of doing what I would do in business, which is just surveying the landscape. And what I realized was there's 6.7 million people in the system, 2.2 million people in prison and jail, actually 4.5 million people on probation and parole. And there were so many great organizations focused on the 2.2 million people, how to get pe you know, people that didn't belong in prison and, and jail out of prison and jail, and dealing, with, dealing with the bail issues and dealing with so many other issues, but nobody was focused on probation and parole. But Meek had already been on probation for 12 years mm -hmm. and had another six years left, okay? And so that's when we said, God, this probation thing is so screwed up. We need to put all of our energy into fixing probation and parole. So I went out immediately and we got, we raised $55 million, over $50 million from nine of us, myself, Jay-Z, Meek, Robert Kraft, Dan Loeb, Mike Novogratz, John and Laura Arnold, uh, Joe and Clara Sai, who just bought the Brooklyn Nets, um, and, um, and, and Robert Smith. And um, we went out, we hired an incredible team, Van Jones, who's running this for us now. We built a, a real organization, and the organization is solely focused on two things. Um, educating people on these issues, because most people don't understand what we've been talking about. That you they, they it's it's prison, not even on the radar right. for most the, people. The, 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 most people think you only go to jail or prison when you commit a crime. And so we need to educate people. And the second thing we need to do is change the laws. And so right now in Pennsylvania, uh, we've spent a huge amount of effort over the past year on getting a bill that's currently in the House and we'll go to the Senate and hopefully get passed in the next several uh, weeks that will actually put limits on how long you can be on probation. It'll give good time behavior. It'll not allow you to go to prison or jail if you don't commit a crime. And this will probably benefit um, more than 100,000 people directly and millions of people indirectly in Pennsylvania. And once we get this done in Pennsylvania, we're going to do it in every other state in the country, and we're gonna going to, of course, go after the worst state. That's right. That does deserve applause. That's a, that's a big deal that's going to change a lot of people's lives. And we got to get it done, and then we got to make sure we implement it and take our business logic yeah. to say, hey, when you get these laws changed, then you got to make sure everything works the way you yeah. think that it's going to work. We're at three and a half percent unemployment in this country. We cannot actually afford to have a whole bunch of people in jail who could otherwise be productive members of society, earning for themselves, prospering, and paying taxes. Yeah, it, it is. I, I don't know how many people saw the story. And one last thing I'll say: there's a guy who um, I read a story about about a month ago who literally um, was involved in a robbery for a few hundred, I think, three hundred dollars when he was 19. Ten years later, he had never had another criminal issue. 
Uh, he couldn't afford his fines, $1,900. He got sent to prison for 18 to 36 months because he couldn't afford his fines. Now, fortunately, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court stepped in and ordered his release a few weeks ago. But it's, there's so many situations like this that happen day in and day out that you know you wouldn't believe is possible. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you three, the, to the three of you. Uh, unfortunately, I am uh, responsible for keeping this thing on time today. I would love to speak to you guys for twice as long, uh, but we're out of time, so I appreciate it. Thank you for contributing your time, your resources, uh, and your intellect to this discussion on civic engagement. Uh, Josh Koppelman, David Edelman, and Michael Rubin.